really want kids to have specific nutritional supplements, additives to their diet, and to protect their brains during, for example, sports. Uh, time and time again, I'm you know seeing children in my office who've had one or more blows to the head in some kind of contact sport at times unprotected, and it's you know that's a permanent injury. But beyond that, even uh, when women are uh, pregnant, uh, that's the time when the brain is being constructed that we really want to jump right in. I wrote a book called Raises Martyr of Child by Kindergarten, right. which really dealt with what are those nutritional concepts that you need to pay very close attention to while you're pregnant and in your child's early years to build the most perfect, most highly efficient computer possible. But even beyond that, that's, that's the nurture part. The other part of that is what can you do from an activity perspective, from an interventional perspective, to really refine how the brain works. You know, it's all about the connections. We talked about that, neuroplasticity. But incredibly, one important factor in refining the brain and making it a more efficient computer has to do with actually losing those connections, a process that we call pruning of the synapses or synaptic pruning. So, the, you know, a child's brain has about uh, 100% more uh, synapse uh, connections than your brain would have, mm-hmm. and what happens beginning you know, early on around age two is the brain starts to reduce the number of connections, to refine it and to make it a faster, more efficient process in terms of processing information. You know, at, at the peak, the brain is losing about 20 billion synapses a day. So, What determines, David, whether someone is smart or not? Now, you want to use the case of Albert Einstein. Did he have an unusual brain compared to most other people? Well, that's been debated. Uh, one, you know, the findings of Albert Einstein's brain, uh, I think, are number one, his brain was much more convoluted. What does it mean? It means there were a lot more uh, hills and valleys. And the reason that that's important is that's a way that the, the brain increases its surface area. It's the same reason that, for example, the intestines have a lot of convolution. Your intestine, if it were unwound and laid out flat, would take up a tennis court <laughs> because of the number yeah. of convolutions that it has. Well, yeah. one thing Albert Einstein's brain had it was a lot more convolutions than would be typical, and indeed the number of, of connections that he had uh, was seemingly quite vast. But, you know, it's interesting that even Albert Einstein said that, uh, has a wonderful quote that I uh, used in the book where he talks about how while he values those individuals in science who do objective research, he values most the works of Jesus, Buddha, and, and uh, Abraham, you know, because of, ostensibly because of what they, the mystery sure. that they were able to tap into. And, you know, at the end of the day, um, what one would do as a typical treating neurologist day-to-day and seeing patients is not very mind intensive and certainly not spiritual and you know uh, as we go through this life when we really want to look at what we can do to be most effective in allowing individuals to really really get someplace aside from just through their illness you know those are the things that really are, in, in my opinion need to come into the medical office it's important information let me ask you about Muhammad Ali for a second He's got Parkinson's disease now. Was that caused by the blows to the head, the constant yes. blows to the there head? There is actually a syndrome called pugilistic Parkinson's, and a pugilist is, of course, a boxer. And it's not uncommon uh, for individuals who've had multiple but repeated blows to the head to develop Parkinson's disease. We know that when the brain uh, is is traumatized in that way, it does two important things. Number one, it causes residual inflammation, just as if you were going to, if you, were, you took out a hammer and <clears throat> kept hitting yourself on the elbow, eventually your elbow would become red and inflamed. Sure. And inflammation uh, and the chemical mediators of inflammation are, in fact, very highly increased in the brains of Alzheimer's patients and even in the brains of Parkinson's patients. We don't recognize that because we don't feel the inflammation like you would feel your hot elbow or arthritic fingers, but... These are inflammatory diseases, and things that increase inflammation increase the risk for those diseases. So it's uh, actually a very good question because, uh, you know, one wonders what is the mechanism, but we, we do see it quite commonly. In uh, 
for people who meditate, they, you know, get into this thought power with their brain. They concentrate. Does that help the brain? Does it make it more efficient? Well, it does a number of things. Uh, clearly, it makes the brain more efficient. But it, uh, in addition, uh, is de- uh, has been demonstrated to have some physiologic effects even throughout the body that then feed back to the brain. By that, I mean uh, when uh, individuals are involved in meditation and even thereafter, their body's production of an important chemical called cortisol, which is made by the adrenal gland, mm-hmm. actually diminishes. And why this is important is at high levels or at even at low levels but constantly being bombarded, Cortisol is very damaging specifically to one part of the brain called the hippocampus. Hippocampus, because uh, it looks like a seahorse. Hippocampus is the Latin name for seahorse. But it turns out that cortisol is actually and uniquely toxic to the hippocampus. And interestingly enough, patients with Alzheimer's disease have higher levels of cortisol uh, excretion uh, when they are confronted with some kind of challenge. Hold on for a second, Dave. We're going to take this break, and let's let's pick that up again when we come back. We're back with Dr. David Perlmutter, Power Up Your Brain. David, so there's abundance of cortisol in the brain. What does that mean? Well, hopefully there wouldn't be, um, but if indeed your adrenal glands are constantly stimulated and putting out a lot of cortisol, the brain doesn't like that, and it is uh, a, a real issue for that part of the brain that is most important for handling memory, for uh, storing memory and actually even retrieving memory, again called the hippocampus. And fundamentally, that's the area of the brain that deteriorates first when an individual has Alzheimer's disease or begins to show signs of Alzheimer's. So, you know, I think we led into this by considering the effect of meditation and the fact that meditation actually does reduce cortisol, but there's so many other things I think that need to be considered in terms of lifestyle. Chronic stress is the other side of that coin. Chronic stress will raise cortisol, Mm -hmm. and therefore, uh, and even severe stressful events in a person's life will uh, raise the set point so that the adrenal glands spit out more cortisol. And that's why people who have experienced, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder have a dramatic increased risk for Alzheimer's. And, you know, there are a lot of, of issues out there that relate to risk for that disease. And, you know, for some reason, no one's wanting to talk about it. I mean... Um, we know that that is actually, for the most part, a preventable disease, and yet, you know, what people are told is really pretty much live your life come what may, and then one day when you wake up and you're uh, one taco short of a combo platter right. mentally, uh, then you'll start taking a medication. But, you know, in point of fact, the, the so-called Alzheimer's medications don't work, according to a recent review in the British Medical Journal that looked at every double-blind, placebo-controlled trial on that class of medications. And categorically, they, they reported that the drugs don't even work, number oh. one. And number two, we know that... And you agree with that? Oh, I do agree okay. with it. I mean, I, I, I find that... I do find the, the, the odd patient, the occasional patient who seemed, or the family thought that perhaps he or she might have improved somewhat on the medication, but it's extremely rare. The problem is that not only are the medications virtually useless, but they're associated with some significant side effects. I mean, I would hope that uh, there would be a medication out that could treat, you know, this cognitive decline. I mean, frankly, uh, if if there were, I would have my father on that medication. He has Alzheimer's, and so I... It's not like I don't know what it's like and don't know what, you know, experience what it's like to have a loved one with that disease. I, I deal with it every single morning before I go to work. But having said that, it's interesting to to consider what the so-called Alzheimer's medications do. They're designed to increase a chemical in the brain, a brain transmitter, which is called acetylcholine. And the medicines are designed to interrupt the enzyme that normally would degrade that acetylcholine with the hope of, therefore, having more acetylcholine around. But we have to take this back three or four steps and ask ourselves, why is there less acetylcholine? Well, there's less acetylcholine because certain nerves have degenerated and died. And those nerves degenerated primarily because they were involved in some kind of inflammatory process. So we have to take steps much earlier on to try to reduce those inflammatory events in the brain that lead to Alzheimer's in the first place. And, you know, it's interesting to note, for example, that the risk of Alzheimer's in Indians uh, living in India, eating a a typical Indian diet, is only 25% of what it is in the United States. Now, that's some powerful information. It's the turmeric. (laughs) 
Very well said. Yeah. We know that the the Indian the, the classic Indian diet is rich in turmeric, curcumin, uh, a spice. It's very inexpensive and it's used throughout India as part of curried foods. And cur- curcumin happens to be a powerful anti-inflammatory. Mm, that's right. But it's not patentable. <laughs> so <laughs> no drug. You, you can't make money that, with it, right? Therefore, you're not going to see on the evening news, you know, somebody. Uh, uh, promoting turmeric as opposed to these medications that are so ubiquitous now in terms of advertising. You know, um, here's a strange question, by the way, about the planet. Why does it seem that the planet, Mother Earth, has remedies for ailments? Isn't it a beautiful thought? It is absolutely unbelievable. We have co-evolved with the various plants, and herbs, and various types of fruits and vegetables. For hundreds of thousands of years, and uh, interestingly enough, you know, it, we're now beginning to understand that the foods we eat are far more than just protein, carbohydrate, and fat. That the food that we eat is information. It is actually what we call an epigenetic factor, meaning, as we talked about earlier, food directly influences the expression of our DNA. Let me give you an example. I wrote a, a Huffington Post um, about two weeks ago about this concept, and, and brought to the attention of the readers the fact that certain foods that we eat, turmeric being one of them, mm-hmm. turn on a pathway called the NRF2 pathway. I don't mean to be too specific, but this is a, is a master controlling point for, number one, enhancing antioxidant protection of the human body and specifically the brain, and number two, reducing inflammation, which has such devastating effects throughout the body, you know, that's the cardinal feature of coronary artery disease, and it's the cardinal feature of Alzheimer's as well. So certain foods specifically do their wondrous thing in our physiologies by turning on genes, and we call that epigenetics. Epi meaning outside of, and genetics meaning genes. Foods like broccoli and green tea and resveratrol, which is found in red wine, and even caffeic acid, which is found in coffee, and as mentioned, turmeric. These are powerful gene expression modulators. And, we're, you know, we used to say, well, blueberries are great because they have high antioxidants. Mm-hmm. But when you're eating a food that turns on the genes to make antioxidants, that is thousands and thousands of times more powerful than just consuming the antioxidant as a supplement or as a specific antioxidant food. You know, every week there's a new exotic berry or juice that comes from some place seemingly very uh, romantic and exotic that's supposed to contain, you know, the highest level of antioxidants since the week before. Uh, but in reality, it's not so much the antioxidants that are contained in these juices and these special berries. It's the real power comes in how they turn on the gene pathways to amplify antioxidant production. That's the home run. So. Another, you know, that's another benefit of things like, for example, turmeric. It's a powerful upregulator of production of antioxidants, far more so than just taking a, a specific antioxidant pill. And it's so easy. Oh, it, it is very easy. You know, that's the feedback we're getting from our new book, Power Up Your Brain, is we've made it easy. We've made it understandable. And these uh, concepts are, you know, have been with us for a long, long time. One of the One of the things that we really focus on, in the book, is actually fasting, uh, having people fast one day a month, and, and beyond that, even reduce their calorie intake. And, and what do you mean by fast? Well, because there's don't so eat many different. Twenty-four hours. Drink. Uh, take your medicines if you're on any. Uh, uh, drink okay. water. Drink water, and you know, believe it or not, you'll be okay. As a matter of fact, what you're doing, fasting, is a powerful epigenetic factor. Sure. Once you get over that hunger feeling, you're okay. Absolutely, but what it does is it actually turns on several important gene pathways. It does activate this NRF2 pathway that we talked about for re- increasing antioxidants, decreasing inflammation, but it also activates a very powerful pathway in the brain that turns on what you and I talked about earlier this evening, and that is neuroplasticity. It turns on the genes that allow the brain to work more efficiently and make better connections. And again, The thesis of the book is doing these things allows you to gain, through neuroplasticity, access to those really intriguing parts of the brain that define us as humans and allow us to gain insight and information. And, you know, it's interesting that fasting 
you know, now we understand the, the chemistry of it all, the biochemistry. Mm-hmm. And that's actually brand new. I mean, the only...